Hi, my name is Jennifer Doudna from UC Berkeley, and I'm here today to tell you about how we uncovered a new genome engineering technology. This story starts with a bacterial immune system. That means understanding how bacteria fight off a viral infection. It turns out that a lot of bacteria have in their chromosome, which is what you're looking at here, a sequence of repeats shown in these black diamonds that are interspaced with sequences that are derived from viruses. And these had been noticed by microbiologists who were sequencing bacterial genomes, but nobody knew what the function of these sequences might be until it was noticed that they tend to also occur with a series of genes that are um, often encode proteins that have homology to enzymes that do interesting things like DNA repair. So it was a hypothesis that this system, which came to be called CRISPR, which is an acronym for this type of repetitive locus, that these CRISPR systems could actually be an acquired immune system in bacteria that might allow sequences to be integrated from viruses and then somehow used later to protect the cell from an infection with that same virus. So this was an interesting hypothesis, and we got involved in studying this in the mid-2000s, right after the publication of three papers that pointed out the incorporation of viral sequences into these genomic loci. And so what emerged over the next several years was that, in fact, these CRISPR systems really are acquired immune systems in bacteria. So until this point, no one knew that bacteria could actually have a way to adapt to viruses that get into the cell. But this is a way that they do it. And it involves detecting foreign DNA that gets injected, like shown in this example, from a virus that gets into the cell. The, um, the, the CRISPR system allows uh, integration of short pieces of those viral DNA molecules into the CRISPR locus. And then in the second step of uh, that's shown here as uh, CRISPR RNA biogenesis, these CRISPR sequences are actually uh, transcribed in the cell into pieces of RNA that are subsequently used together with proteins encoded by the Cas genes, these CRISPR-associated genes, to form interfering or interference complexes that can use the information in the form of these RNA molecules to base pair with matching sequences in viral DNA. So a very nifty way that bacteria have come up with to take their invaders and turn the sequence information against them. So um, in my own laboratory, we have been very interested for a long time in understanding how RNA molecules are used to help cells to, uh, under, to, to figure out how to regulate the expression of proteins from the genome. And so this seemed like also a very interesting example of this. And so we started studying the basic molecular mechanisms by which this pathway operates. And uh, in, in 2011, I went to a scientific conference and I met a colleague of mine, Emmanuel Charpentier, who is shown in this uh, picture on the far left. And Emmanuel's lab uh, works on microbiology uh, problems, and they're particularly interested in bacteria that are human pathogens. She was studying an organism called Streptococcus pyogenes, which is a, a bacterium that can cause very severe infections in humans. And what was curious in this bug was that it has a CRISPR system, and in that organism, there was a single gene encoding a protein known as Cas9 that had been shown genetically to be required for function of the CRISPR system in, in Streptococcus pyogenes. But nobody knew at the time what the function of that protein was. And so we got together and uh, recruited people from our respective research labs to start testing the function of Cas9. And so the key people in the project are shown here in the, in the photograph. In the center is Martin Yinek, who was a postdoctoral associate in my own lab. And next to him in the blue shirt is Christoph Chylinski, who was a student in Emmanuel's lab. And so these two guys, together with Inez Fanfara, who's on the far right, uh, postdoc with Emmanuel, began doing experiments across 
the Atlantic and um, sharing their data. And what they figured out was that Cas9 is actually a, a fascinating protein that has the ability to interact with DNA and generate a double-stranded break in DNA at sequences that match the sequence in a guide RNA. And in this uh, slide, what you're seeing is the guide RNA and the sequence of the guide in orange that base pairs with one strand of the double, double helical DNA. And very importantly, this RNA interacts with a second RNA molecule called tracer that forms a structure that recruits the Cas9 protein. So those two RNAs and the single protein in nature are what are required for uh, this protein to recognize what would normally be viral DNAs in the cell, and, uh, just, and the protein is able to cut these up literally by uh, breaking up the double helical DNA. And so when we figured this out, um, we thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually um, generate a simpler system than nature has done by linking together these two RNA molecules to generate a system that would be a single protein and a single uh, guiding RNA. And so the idea was to basically take the, uh, the, these two RNAs that you see on the, on the far side of the slide and, um, and then basically link them together to create what we call a single guide RNA. And so Martin Ginek in the lab made that construct. And um, we did an experiment, a very simple experiment, to test whether we truly had a programmable DNA cleaving enzyme. And the idea was to generate short uh, single guide RNAs that recognize different sites in a DNA molecule, this uh, circular DNA molecule that you see here. And the guide RNAs were designed rec to recognize the sequences shown by the red bars in the slide. And the experiment was then to take that plasmid, that circular uh, DNA molecule, and incubate it with two different uh, restriction or cutting enzymes, one called SAL1, which uh, cuts the, the DNA sort of uh, upstream at the far end of the DNA in this picture in the gray box, and the second site being directed by the RNA-guided Cas9 at these different sites shown in red. And very simple experiment. We did this uh, incubation reaction in, uh, with plasmid DNA, and this is the result. And so this is what you're looking at is an agarose uh, gel that allows us to separate the cleaved molecules of DNA. And what you can see is that in each of these reaction lanes, we get a different sized DNA molecule released from this doubly digested plasmid. That, uh, in which the size of the DNA corresponds to cleavage at the different sites directed by these uh, guide RNA sequences indicated in red. So this was a really exciting moment, actually. Very simple experiment that was kind of an aha moment when we said we really have a programmable DNA cutting enzyme, and we can program it with a short piece of RNA to cleave essentially any uh, double-stranded DNA sequence. So the reason we were so excited about a, an enzyme that could be programmed to generate double-stranded DNA breaks at any sequence is because there was a long-standing uh, set of experiments in the scientific community that showed that cells have ways of repairing double-stranded DNA breaks that lead to changes in the genomic information in, in, the, in the DNA. And these, um, so this is a slide that just shows that after a double-stranded break is generated by any kind of enzyme that might do this, including the Cas9 system, those double-stranded breaks in a cell are detected and repaired by two types of pathways. One on the, uh, on the left-hand side that is, involves non-homologous end joining, in which the ends of the DNA are chemically ligated back together, usually with the introduction of a small insertion or deletion at the site of the break. Um, and then on the right-hand side is another way that repair occurs through homology-directed uh, uh, repair in which a donor DNA molecule that has sequences that match those flanking the site of the double-stranded break can be integrated into the genome at the site of the break to introduce new gen uh, genetic information into the genome. And so this. Um, had given many scientists the idea that if there were a tool or a technology that allowed 
scientists or researchers to introduce double-stranded breaks at targeted sites in the DNA of a cell, then together with all of the genome sequencing data that are now available, where we know the whole uh, genetic sequence in a cell, and if you knew where a mutation occurred that causes a disease, for example, you could actually use a technology like this to introduce DNA that would fix a mutation or generate a mutation that you might like to study in a research setting. So um, the power of this technology is really the idea that we can now generate these types of double-stranded breaks at sites that we choose as scientists by programming Cas9 and then allow the cell to make repairs that introduce genomic changes at uh, the sites of these breaks. But the challenge was how to generate the breaks in the first place. And so a number of different strategies uh, had been uh, produced for doing this in different labs. Most of them, um, and I'm going to show two specific examples here, uh, one called zinc finger nucleases and the other uh, tau effector domains. These are both uh, programmable ways to generate double-stranded breaks in DNA that rely on protein-based recognition of DNA sequences. So these are proteins that are modular and can be uh, generated in different uh, combinations of modules to recognize uh, different DNA sequences, requiring, so it works uh, as a technology, but it requires a lot of protein engineering to do so. And what's uh, really exciting about the, uh, this CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme is that it's an RNA programmed protein. So a single protein can be used for any site uh, of DNA that, where we would like to generate a break by simply changing the sequence of the guide RNA associated with Cas9. So instead of relying on protein-based recognition of DNA, we're, require, we're relying on RNA-based uh, recognition of DNA, as shown at the bottom. And so what this means is that it's just a, a system that is um, simple enough to use that anybody with basic molecular biology training can take advantage of this system to do genome engineering. And so um, this is a tool then that, that really, I think, fills out the, an essential, a previously missing component of what we could call biology's IT toolbox that includes not only the ability to sequence uh, DNA and look at its structure, we know about the double helix since the 1950s. And then um, in the last few decades, it's been possible to use enzymes like restriction enzymes and the polymerase chain reaction to isolate and amplify particular segments of DNA. And now with Cas9, we have a technology that enables facile genome engineering that is uh, you know, available to labs around the world for experiments that they might want to, to do. And so this is a summary of, of this of, of the, uh, the technology. It's a two-component system. It relies on RNA-DNA base pairing for recognition. And very importantly, because of the way that this system works, it's actually quite straightforward to uh, do something called multiplexing, which means we can program Cas9 with multiple different guide RNAs in the same cell to generate multiple breaks and do things like cut out large segments of a chromosome and, and simply delete them. In, the same ex in, in one experiment. And so this has led to a, a real explosion in uh, the field of biology and genetics with many labs uh, around the world adopting this technology for all sorts of very interesting and creative kinds of applications. And this is a, a slide that's actually almost out of date now, but just to give you a sense of the uh, way that the uh, field has really taken off. So we published our original work on Cas9 in 2012. And up until that point, there was very little research going on uh, on CRISPR biology anywhere. Uh, it's a very small field. And then you can see that starting in 2013 and, and extending until now, there's just been this uh, incredible uh, explosion in publications from labs that are using this as a genome engineering technology. So it's been uh, really very exciting for me as a basic scientist to see what started as a fundamental research project turn into a technology that uh, turns out to be very enabling for all sorts of exciting uh, experiments. And I just wanted to close by um, sharing with you a few things that uh, are going on using this technology. So of course, uh, on the left-hand side, lots of, lots of basic biology that can be done now with the uh, engineering of model organisms and different kinds of cell lines that are cultured in the laboratory to study the behavior of cells, um, but also in biotechnology, being able to do 
uh, to make uh, targeted changes in plants and various kinds of fungi that could be very useful for different sorts of industrial applications. And, and then, of course, in biomedicine, with lots of interest in the potential to use this technology as a tool for um, you know, really uh, coming up with novel therapies for human disease, I think, is something that's very exciting and is really a, a something that's on the horizon already. And then this uh, slide just really indicates uh, where I think we're going to see this going in the future with a, a lot of uh, interesting and creative kinds of directions that are coming along in different labs, both in academic uh, research laboratories, but also increasingly in commercial labs that are going to enable the, um, you know, the use of this technology for all sorts of applications that we, many of which we couldn't have even imagined uh, even two years ago. So very exciting. And I want to uh, just acknowledge a great team of people that have been involved in working on the project with me. And we've had the, the you know, terrific uh, financial support from various groups as well. And um, it's been a pleasure to share this with you. Thank you. <laughs>